This series of lectures is all about Descartes and how he outlines his ideas for knowing facts about the world or synthetic truths a priori or before experience. We are looking again at how Descartes uses deduction as a method to arrive at truths about the existence of God and also of the external world, both a priori. This time we will be looking at the cosmological and ontological arguments for God and we will then look at how Descartes also arrives at knowledge of the external world as an a priori deduction. Firstly, the cosmological argument. This is probably the longest of most God arguments you will ever see, but don't be put off by it, because if we take it section by section, we can see that there are different deductions being made at different stages. Cosmological arguments tend to look at the existence of things and th they show a relationship of dependency of one thing on another. The gist of this argument is, I am here as a thinking thing and continue to exist as a thinking thing. This means there must be something out there sustaining me and keeping me going and that thing must be God. In the first series of arrows, the first row, Descartes is thinking that I must come from somewhere and if I had caused myself to exist, I would have made myself better than this and given myself a few extra powers. The next series of arrows, he then goes to, to an interesting series of points about how we need something to keep us existing. Now I know that we could say that we use water and food and oxygen to do this, but I think Descartes is thinking of this in terms of a thinking mind. Remember Berkeley also looks at the presence of God as a sustaining power. Then, in the third stage of deduction, Descartes uses something that we've just seen, the trademark argument, to say that whatever this thing is that creates and sustains me, it's got to be bigger and better than me. Then finally, in the last section, Descartes is thinking about the nature of this creating and sustaining power and how it came about. Using the reasoning that nothing can regress or go back forever and we need a starting point, Descartes eventually reach the, reaches the conclusion that, that there must be some uncaused causa and this must be God. Now for empiricist responses, we can use Hume's points again. Remember when he said about what a cause is, it is simply a term we use to refer to one event following another on a regular basis. How can we use it about these one-off events? My creation and God's creation. We haven't experienced either and certainly not on a regular basis. Hume also points out that all this talk of causation is coming from our experience of causation in the world. Claims such as that as all things are caused must come a posteriori and not as Descartes claims as intuitions and deductions. How can we ever say that all events are caused? Have we experienced all past, present and future events? No. So as a strict empiricist, Hume has to question the basis of any argument that uses the idea of universal causation as a foundation. It's absolutely impossible to prove. We can see that if we do question whether all events do actually have a cause, then the foundations for his arguments have lost their placing.
And another very powerful question comes from Hume on what kind of God, of any God argument, can we really establish or point towards? Here Hume allows that even if there is some power needed to cause anything, to cause these ideas I have and to cause me existing over time, why does this need to be the all-loving and all-powerful God of classical belief? Why couldn't we accept that this might be a being that is not all-powerful or loving and they might actually enjoy deceiving us? Remember what Descartes is trying to establish. He needs to know that an evil demon is not deceiving his senses and his ability to reason. The only way to do this is to prove that a loving God exists and certainly wouldn't allow this to happen. So when it comes to God, Descartes has to do two things. Number one, establish the existence of God. Number two, to establish a loving and not a deceiving God. And finally, Descartes arrives at his ontological argument for God. We will briefly look at this now, but we will cover it later in another part of the course. So for now, let's look at it as an argument that could help Descartes establish God as the right kind of God. Ontological arguments look at proving God just by looking at the definition of what God means. God is said to be perfect, and we mean by this that God is complete and full. Nothing, nothing is lacking with God. The argument runs as follows. I have an idea of God as a perfect being. A perfect being must have all perfections. Existence is a perfection. Therefore, God must exist. So God is all powerful, not just quite a bit powerful, and God is all loving. Nothing is lacking. God is 100% of all of these attributes. Now think about this. God is perfect, not lacking anything. And this also means that God cannot lack existence. God has to exist. And this is what God means, a being who has it all. In some ways, we can see the ontological argument as a more satisfactory a priori deduction, as it is less dependent on all that talk on causation that Hume used to attack the trademark and the cosmological arguments. So David Hume once again. David Hume has got a lot to say on God arguments, but let's just have a look at recapping what we know so far. First of all, we've looked at cause is a term that means one thing coming before another thing on a regular basis, his constant conjunction argument that we can't use for one-off events and we can only use through experience. And the second point that we've looked at is Hume challenging the principle of universal causation, that to claim that everything has a cause is impossible to prove. Now we're going to look at Hume's fork. Hume's fork is possibly the most useful argument and idea that you can learn and use in many parts of this philosophy exam. Hume's fork is like a Swiss army knife. It has so many uses. Let's look at how we can apply it here to the rationalist claim that we can come to knowledge before experience. Hume gets us looking at the very limited scope that that knowledge would be. Hume argues that knowledge is of two types. Relations of ideas concern things like mathematical mathematics and definitions of concepts. The example we often give is that a triangle is a three-sided shape. 
This knowledge is conceptual. We don't need to see a triangle to know that a triangle has certain necessary features, its three sides. The key thing with relations of ideas is that this type of knowledge, when expressed, is contradictory to deny. So it makes no sense to say a triangle doesn't have three sides. It makes no sense to say that bachelor is married. These are contradictory to deny. But the kinds of knowledge you get here are quite limited. They concern definitions and what a concept is, rather than saying anything about the world itself and what exists. The only way to know anything about the world, the only way to arrive at synthetic knowledge, or matters of fact here, is through experience. To know about the existence of anything, or to know about how, how and what causes anything, has to be done through experience and not from the mind alone. Hume thinks rationalists are wasting their time trying to argue that anything more than definitions can come about through thinking. So looking at the claims that Descartes has made in the bottom box, that God must exist and I exist as a thinking thing, Hume classifies these claims as matters of fact, as they are not contradictory to deny. There is nothing contradictory to say that God doesn't exist or I don't exist as a thinking thing. Substantial knowledge can only come through experience. So any possible evidence of God cannot come through reason alone. Descartes then moves on to a proof of the external world as an a priori deduction. This discussion centres around how we come to have the concept of physical substances. Now we know in meditation one that sense data can be really deceptive, so we can't trust our senses. So Descartes must find a way to prove that the external world exists using a priori deductions and intuitions. Now, by the time he does this in Meditation 6, Descartes has already established the cogito and that a non-deceiving God exists, so he can use these certainties to help establish an external world. Descartes' argument for an external world runs as follows. I have involuntary perceptual experience of physical objects. So I smell things I don't want to and I see things I don't want to. These have to come from somewhere. These can't be from my mind as they'd be voluntary then. And these are involuntary we're talking about. So they must come from something outside of me. And this leads to two possibilities. God or physical objects actually existing out there in an external world. Now, if it's God, he's made it seem as if these objects really exist. And that sort of God would mean he was a deceiving God, putting these ideas that are false in my mind. But God is perfect and cannot be a deceiver. Therefore, it can't be God causing these. It has to be that physical objects exist in an external world. <laughs> 